right, so my first concept right here, we're talking about gas exchange, so we gotta talk about how gases flow. And uh, we always talk about the partial pressure of the gas. And the idea is that partial pressure gradients of gases work like concentration gradients. will flow from an area of higher partial pressure to lower partial pressure. Okay, and that's an easy enough concept to understand. And so the idea of a partial pressure is easy. It's part of a gas mix that is part of a total pressure. So for example, let's say we have a, um, a gas canister that's sealed. So the gases can't flow. Um, I don't know, so maybe you have these red gas molecules. And it's in a sealed chamber. So they're just going to bounce around, exerting a pressure against the canister wall. And let's say you throw in another gas in there. How about a green gas? Or two gas molecules. Now you have gas mix, and you're just bouncing around in there, and maybe throw the third gas molecule, blue. Now, now I got three different gases, five, two, and three. So, so the partial pressure, capital P, if I want a total pressure, I just add up the partial pressures of the three. Okay. We got the partial pressure due to the red gas molecules plus the partial pressure of the blue and then the partial pressure of the green. And so what's my total pressure? P total. Well, it's 10 because I intentionally drew 10 dots. Okay? That's all it is. And so when we talk about the partial pressures of any gas, that's all we're talking about. Okay. I wish my chemistry instructor explained it that way. Um, so don't be confused about partial pressure. Now, to apply it to this lecture, here are the real gases that we need to talk about. And if you notice, um, the air we breathe, atmosphere, right? That's the air we breathe. It gives you the gas mix. I mean, it's mostly nitrogen oxygen. Okay. And so, um, I don't know if you remember yesterday. under a column of air, the atmosphere. Okay. And what we see is that it's mostly nitrogen, oxygen. So let's just say it's about 79.21 in terms of percentage. It's about 79% nitrogen, about roughly 21% oxygen, O2. Right? That's you living under it, and that's the pressure on your body surface. And, and that's 100%, okay? I mean, CO2 and H2 are kind of negligible, but let's just kind of like go with that. Um, so how you would calculate the partial pressure of nitrogen and oxygen, 
since we know the percentages, you just go so the partial pressure of nitrogen, just multiply 0 0.79 times the total pressure, which is, well, you know, it's 760, right? Millimeters of mercury. And if you did that, it would give you approximately what you see calculated here. Okay, you know, roughly 600. And if you did the same thing for O2, it would give you roughly what it says there, roughly uh, 160. That will give you a total pressure of 760. Okay, and that stays relatively constant. The atmosphere, of course, if you go um, down down a bit, say you go down to uh, Death Valley. Now there's more air on top of you. If there's more air on top of you, what happens to the atmospheric pressure? Does it increase or decrease? Mm -hmm. It should increase. There's more air on top of you. Um, so, I don't know, call it 770 instead of 760. So you could probably Google barometric pressure of Death Valley right now. Well, if it's not that number, don't call me out. Hey, I looked it up. It's not 770. You're wrong. I'm teaching the concept, right? What's the concept? If there's more air on top of you, you increase the barometric pressure. So conversely, you can go up the mountain, right? Now you're, now, now you're up here, I guess. Now there's less air on top of you, you know, the air is thinner, and the concept is at altitude or at a higher elevation, you know, at altitude, maybe it's 750, okay? And so it can change depending on where you are on Earth. But for the most part, we, we just say sea level, okay? So if we say sea level, assume 760. If we say altitude, assume it's like in Denver or something. We don't say high altitude, low altitude. I don't think those terms are usually used. We just say altitude is high, sea level is sea level. Yeah. I don't know if there's a term when you go down. Um, now, if you compare the air we breathe, you put it through your respiratory system, it gets all the way to the alveolar spaces. The alveoli, it kind of the numbers change, uh, and these are the numbers we want to go with. Them. This is what's physiologically important, not so much this. It's good to know this, but this is what is available um, for gas exchange. And let's pay attention to these two numbers. I'm going to ignore water vapor and nitrogen for this um, lecture. It's pretty much these are the gases that we exchange when we talk about gas exchange in the human physiology lecture. So. Let me erase this. I don't think we need it anymore. <coughs> so I've always been um, illustrating respiratory system like this, and basically, let's say you breathe air in. Now, I, I kind of said this space maybe it represents the dead space, remember that? And then for this space is where you're going to have the alveolar air. So air is 
coming in um, in these percentages. But by the time he gets to I'll do those cases, let's, let's commit this, these numbers to memory, 104, 40. So the partial pressure of O2 is 104, and the units are always millimeters of mercury, and that's the pressure unit, and the partial pressure due to CO2 is about 40. And this is kind of what we want the values to be when you're breathing in the fresh air with each breath in. That's what um, makes it to the alveolar spaces, and this is what is available for um, gas to exchange. Now, the reason why the numbers change, I mean, there's a couple of reasons. Um, one is, you take a breath of fresh air, it, it's mixing with the air from the previous breath. Sometimes they call that stale air. There is air sitting in the conducting airways from before. And it kind of mixes, it dilutes. There's water vapor in the um, conducting airways, and that kind of dilutes things. So basically, the, those are the reasons why uh, the numbers change. As the air molecules go from here to deep inside here, okay? All right, so um, now you have fresh air available to exchange with the flowing blood. And we can look at this picture. And um, throughout the course, I kind of use the terms O2 rich, O2 poor, or CO2 rich, CO2 poor. But now we're going to just put numbers to it. And we're, this figure uses the partial pressure to refer to kind of the rich poor thing. All right, so um, let's imagine we got a pulmonary capillary. And what we see from this figure, if you remember our cardiovascular stuff, blood's coming in deoxygenated. Not unoxygenated, deoxygenated. It's not zero, but it's 40. That, that's considered deoxygenated. Uh, 40, 45 is pretty much the numbers for O2 poor CO2. And that, that what is entering from the pulmonary circulation, the arteries to the pulmonary capillaries there. Okay, so blood's coming in, PO2 40, PCO2 45. That, that's what is coming in. And so remember, these gradients are just like concentration gradients. You're just going to go from high to low. And you're just going to equilibrate with these numbers. Okay, so let's consider each blood gas separately. First, for O2, PO2104, PO240, looks like the gradient is such that blood will pick up the O2. I'm just going to like go, you know, what picks it up. And it looks like there's a less steep gradient, still a gradient for CO2 to dump into the alveolar space. So I'll just kind of do that. You've equilibrated the blood coming in, well, blue blood, and as I draw it in blue, it's equilibrating with the alveolar air. So blood leaving, if it's equilibrated with the alveolar air, will have these same numbers. So blood leaving is now oxygen rich, PO2 104, PCO2 40, partial pressure CO2 40, and that's the blood that's leaving returning to the left heart. So this gas exchange, when you exchange at your lungs with the alveolar air, the fresh air, that's called external respiration. You're exchanging across, well, I defined this in the anatomy lecture, as the respiratory membrane, where the blood gases are literally traversing to get in and out. 
Guys, so those are the numbers we're going with, 104.40. Any questions so far on external respiration? External is a relative term. So what's the opposite? Internal. Internal. Right here. Okay, so, I mean, that's the whole point, right? You use the circulatory system as a long-distance transport mechanism to get this blood where it needs to go. So this blood then travels to, say, let's say you got some body cells here. Uh, you know, body cells. We like to call this the, the, the peripheral tissues. tissues, cells have metabolism. They're doing work. They're doing all the work of, you know, glycolysis and the electron transport chain, all the biochemistry things that cells do, our bodies. And, well, um, they use up the O2, and CO2 is kind of like an accumulated waste product in the tissues. So, in the tissues, well, you can see it down here. It tells you. It's like 40 or less than 40 for the O2 in, maybe 45 or greater. Okay, so let's just kind of go with that. CO2 40, CO2 45, and these units are still our millimeters of mercury for both. Okay, so this is the um, environment, and so basically the tissues need to dump CO2 into the blood, take it away, and they need oxygen. Talked about that plenty of times, and so blood, blood's coming in. One hundred four forty. PO two, PCO two. Yeah, that, that's what is coming in, and so again, it's just concentration gradients, or excuse me, partial pressure gradients, behaving like concentration gradients. You're going to make passive exchanges. Uh, you know, with, you're going to equilibrate with whatever this is for your tissues. So it looks, like, it looks like now the gradient is such that oxygen will leave. And that the blood will pick up the CO2. Well, it's just kind of reverse. You're just equilibrating with the environment. So now blood leaving is PO240 and PCO245. And that's pretty much it. And well, now we know what happens. This spent blood, it pretty much will circulate back to the right heart. <laughs> And the right heart will pump it back to the lungs and it will circulate again, become reoxygen. So this is called um, internal respiration. Gas exchange at the peripheral tissues. So I've taught this slide now, except for I put this in here to remind me to mention something else. Before I talk about FRC, any questions on uh, the external or the internal respiration? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a mistake. I did flip that. Thank you. One. So it is about 104. Notice they change it to about 100. They go from 104 here to 100. So it does change a little bit, but not 140. That was a mistake. And some books may say 103. Okay, But if it's close to 104, 103, 100, you know, because like when you take an online test and we change the numbers on you a little bit, you get really nervous about that. Yeah. But as long as it's, you know, in the ballpark, you know, from 02, 104, 103, 100, that's about what we say it is. Any other questions? Now for the PCO2, it's pretty much 40, 45. Sometimes I see 46. 
instead of 45, but it's really close to that. All right, let's move on. I want to talk about FRC, because as you breathe in and out, um, I want students to understand what's the function of FRC. We defined it as a volume of being the residual volume and the expiratory, uh, the expiratory reserve volume and then the residual volume. But what is its function? I mean, that's what it is, but what's its function? And books usually don't talk about this. Uh, they should, because they call it function, functional residual capacity. So what's the function of it? So let me erase this. I don't think I need it. So the first thing I'll say is um, keep this slide um, handy. I mean, I'm going to talk about those four points, but I'm not going to necessarily write them on the board so you have them in your notes. Write consult slide in your notes to remind yourself, oh, what, which slide? Oh, yeah, this slide. You said to look at that. But I will write that the goal of me teaching this idea of the function of FRC is the goal is that you have steady state blood gases. That's the goal. <laughs> steady state blood gases, you know, for our. O2, CO2, those gases, right? That's what we're talking about this morning. Steady state. They just stay at a constant level. They don't, they don't fluctuate. Because um, you may think with each breath in, each breath out, the values could go up and down. And we, would, we don't want that. Okay? We want the blood gases to be constant. Cells don't like constant change and um, things. So FRC buffers these changes. So they don't get this fluctuation, you get more of a steady state. So for example, let's consider during a breath in inspiration. This is about two and a half liters of air in your lungs, regardless if you're breathing in or breathing out. So imagine this FRC, it's like a big mixing chamber. Okay, and that air is always there, whether you're taking a breath in or a breath out. So during inspiration, that big mixing chamber FRC it buffers a big jump in O2 in pulmonary blood. Because when you breath in, you're, you're getting the oxygen. Okay? But FRC buffers a big jump. During inspiration, FRC provides a reservoir for CO2 mixing. So the blood flow in by can still dump CO2 in the alveolus, even during a breath in. Okay? I mean, usually you breathe out to get rid of the CO2. But during a breath in, you can still get rid of the CO2 from the blood because it can still enter this big mixing chamber, even though you're breathing in. In the blood, it's still entering the alveolus. Same thing for a breath out. We breathe out to get rid of CO2. But FRC buffers a big drop. Okay, And during a breath out, FRC provides an O2-rich reservoir. You can still deliver blood from the alveolus to the blood while you're breathing out. Okay. So in that way, you're able to keep the values steady state. FRC buffers against large changes in alveolar air. And we then like to keep the partial pressures of alveolar gases at steady state at about you know our 104 40 values. So imagine if you held the breath. Good example. You know, I'll hold the breath for about a minute. So I'll imagine my system as I've been drawing it. 
big cork there, which is analogous to holding your breath. You're not ventilating anymore. Now, you, usually when you ventilate, you ventilate to keep the values around 104.40, around there. But when you hold your breath, no fresh air is getting in anymore. But blood keeps going round and round. And to prove it to yourself, hold your breath and take your pulse. You know, it's blood still circulating even though you're holding your breath. So, Change for a little while, maybe less than a second, but can't you see really quickly how, like, after maybe a second with no fresh air coming in, eventually what's going to happen is um, these numbers will equilibrate with these numbers because you don't got fresh air coming in. This is the importance of breathing. So eventually these numbers will be will change to 40, 45. And then blood leaving will be 40, 45. Because no fresh air is coming in. Okay? So, okay, first thing, keep on breathing. And we kind of keep these numbers around here. All right? The other thing we like to uh, mention is how not only do you got to keep on breathing, this idea of air goes in and out, blood goes round and round, they're coupled. Okay, so the fancy way to say that is ventilation, perfusion coupled. Ventilation refers to breathing, perfusion refers to blood flow. They're coupled tightly. And um, that's the next idea. So the rate of breathing, the, the rate of ventilation is to um, with inspiration, you keep delivering the O2, and you keep the elimination of CO2 by expiration. Okay, you keep the elimination of CO2 happening from ex in the expired air. Now, that rate of ventilation needs to be matched with the rate of perfusion, because the blood will always take away the O2 that's being delivered to the alveolus, and the um, blood will dump CO2 into the alveolar space. Okay, so these have to be matched so the function can occur. And um, so I already gave the example of breath holding. If you stop breathing, ventilation, uh, ventilation that is, perfusion keeps happening. And so, <clears throat> we ventilate to keep oxygen high and we ventilate to keep PO2 low. Just think of it that way. As long as you breathe, PO2 stays high, PCO2 stays low, 104, 40. Now, it turns out in lungs, you may have varying ventilation. Your lungs from top to bottom may be ventilated differently. So you have to distribute the blood flow in the capillaries, in the pulmonaries, uh, pulmonary capillaries differently to match it. So let's remember. Blood flow, the function is you're picking up oxygen from the air sacs. Okay, so you want to match the blood flow for that function. Keep this in your mind with this idea of ventilation, perfusion, coupling. The function of the system is we want the blood to pick up oxygen 
okay, and dump CO2. So the blood picks up O2, and the blood dumps CO2. So keep that in mind, and this should make sense. And so the first, you can mismatch in either way, um, this way or this way. The first mismatch is you're underventilated and overperfused. It's a mismatch. Write that down and let's think why that's a mismatch. If the goal is to pick up O2, but you're underventilating that space, you got a lot of blood flowing through there, there's not a lot of O2 to pick up. So that's why it's a mismatch. And the same reason is it's going to be hard to dump the CO2 in it if it's underventilated. That's why that's a mismatch. So for whatever reason, not a lot of fresh air is is getting there. So you want to like constrict. That's what's showing you there. Constrict the pulmonary arterial. So you match it. I'll put VC basal constrict. So now it's matched. Now it's under perfuse. What is constricting doing? It's restricting the blood flow, so it's less perfused. Oh, okay. So now it's matched. Does that make sense though? Now I've thought about this a lot. This is the this is actually the reverse of what I taught you before. What I taught you before is Look at these here. In this um, alveolar space, there's less oxygen. That's what it says there, because it's underventilated. What I taught you before is, if tissues have less oxygen, you dilate to let more oxygen, let more blood in. That's what I taught you before, right? But this is different. Everything's reversed in pulmonary circulation. Now, when you have less O2, um, now you constrict. I mean, before you dilate it. So it, it's the reversal of what I taught you. And that's why I mentioned this first. The function is different. We're trying to pick up O2. What I taught you before is you're trying to deliver the O2. Okay, so that, it's, it's a different function there. But as long as this makes sense, like you, you just want to match it. So let's talk about the other mismatch. You see what they're trying to show you there? Now it's overventilated and underperfused. about the function of the respiratory system. It's like we're wasting blood flow um, to other places. We want to get the blood to here. You got lots of oxygen here, you want to pick it up. But you're underperfused, so dilate. Please dilate VD, pulmonary arterial. So now it's overperfused. So you want the blood flow to match the ventilation so that the function is you know, maximized there. So that's the idea of that figure. So basically, these things are coupled, the breathing and the blood flow. The body self-regulates that. So if everything's coupled nicely, what this picture shows you is um, our gas exchange, blood coming in, equilibrates with our numbers, 140, the blood leaves 140. The question for you is, how long does it take for these exchanges to happen? And the answer is here. At least for oxygen, they show you. Um, based on this graph, could you answer the question? How long does it take? About a quarter second. It's pretty fast. Okay. About a quarter second, those equilibrations happen. That's 
blink of an eye. It's really quick, basically. Now, what I don't like about this is they don't show the equilibration of the other blood gas. Uh, but anyways, let me write this on the board. is the equilibration of the blood gases occurs in about 0.25 seconds. For O2 and CO2, this one only shows O2, so I included another figure. It's not as fancy, but you see the idea here. On the bottom of the uh, figure, they show you the alveolar air. And this book says it's 103.40. Blood's coming in, 40.46. It makes the capillary, this is a better model of it. Capillaries usually surround the alveolar space. And as um, things equilibrate, as pulmonary blood flows around it, Blood is leaving about 140, okay? So they show the equilibration occurring at about a quarter second or less than a quarter second. So for O2, blood picks it up. So it increases from 40 to about 103. And then for the PCO2, blood drops it off, so it decreases from about 46 uh, to about 40. Now, the time it takes is not very long. So now we know that gas is exchanged, the equilibration happens really quick. Now we can start to talk about how um, blood is transported. I'm sorry, how blood gases are transported. We know how blood is transported by the blood vessels. One picture they include in the book, I think is a good one, is they show that you put CO2 under pressure to carbonate your beverage. And um, so if you apply pressure, the gas molecules, well I guess CO2 is used to carbonate beverages, it has to cross the air-liquid interface. And that's a good analogy because that's what it is for us. Air is a gas, but our blood is a liquid. So those gas molecules have to cross from alveolar air into our liquid blood, just like soda pop. However, well, you know, our blood isn't soda pop. There's actually more to it. So our, our blood gases can be dissolved, just like soda pop, hence the use of the term partial pressure. If you have a gas in a liquid, it's exerting a pressure. Okay, and if you don't believe me, just shake up a can of soda pop and then open it in your face. And you, you'll find out that pressure is in there, is in the liquid. Okay. And if, of course, if you open the can, eventually things equilibrate. But um, what I really want to emphasize is blood has hemoglobin, right? And you knew that. But I've been using this term partial pressure. Once O2 is bound to the hemoglobin, it does not exert a partial pressure, OK? So that PO2 value only refers to the oxygen, like in the soda pop. It's not bound to anything. It's just dissolved in the plasma. Okay. But because we have hemoglobin, we have to talk about that. So let me um, give you some numbers here. Sometimes I give you numbers, and you don't really have to know. These numbers, you have to know. Uh, they're very important in terms of understanding the arterial content of blood. So the arterial O2 content of blood, um, let's just go 100%. Now, if you want to put a value to it, um, one way it's done is in milliliters of oxygen per deciliter blood. 
as a unit of concentration. And 100% of the O2 that's in the blood is about 20 mils O2 per deciliter of blood. That's, a, that's about 100% of what our blood can carry. However, there's different ways you can transport that 20 ml per deciliter. Okay? So one way is like the soda pop. The O2 is just dissolved in the plasma. It goes from alveolus to plasma, doesn't bind to anything, exerts a partial pressure. So we call that dissolved. That, that's our whole PO2 thing. Turns out it's only 0.3 of that 20. So you're like, well, where's the other 19.7? Well, that's the part that's combined. Well, in this example, what does what binds oxygen in the red blood cells? Hemoglobin. hemoglobin, right? So the rest is bound to hemoglobin. It's called HbO2, right? In a previous lecture, we named that oxyhemoglobin. It's like 19.7. questions on what I did there, I just kind of told you the breakdown. This is how oxygen is transporting. This is pretty, hemoglobin is pretty important, right? It's transporting most of it. Now, I've been harping on this dissolved PO2 104. I wasn't playing a trick on you. It's really important. But it turns out it's only 0.3 of the 20. Okay. But we still call that, when we refer to partial pressure, oxygen rich. Just turns out most of it's chemically combined. And this number changes too. I mean, it could be a little more, a little less, but roughly something like that. Um, okay. So this is like, if you do one hundred as a percentage, this is only like 1.5%, 98.5% as a percentage. Most of it's transported in hemoglobin. So let's, let's do the same thing for CO2, arterial. CO2 content of blood. Now the number is like 60. 60 ml is 100%. 60. And um, of that 60, how does it break down? Some of it is dissolved, right? Just like, you know, our 104, CO2 104, so dissolved. PCO2. It's 5, 5 ml. I'm sorry, gosh, I made another mistake. That's CO2, gosh. Sorry, so CO2, CO2. And um, the CO2, 5 mils per deciliter. So 5 of that 60, that's roughly 7%, is dissolved. So there's a lot left. Um, turns out some of it is bound to hemoglobin. HbCO2, okay, that's carbaminohemoglobin, that's the name for it. About 23% is transported bound to hemoglobin, and that's about 15 ml CO2 per deciliter of blood. So I should put blood in my thing here, I should be consistent. Turns out most of CO2 is transported in the form of bicarbonate, about 70%. Bicarb. Now bicarbonate 
is HCO3 whole negative charge, about 70%. So technically that's not CO2, but there's a CO2 in it. It has to chemically react to get there. You take the CO2, you hydrate it with water, you get carbonic acid, you know, it's a weak acid, it partially dissociates. I'll go over that later. But anyways, there's a CO2 within bicarbonate, and that's how you transport the CO2 in the plasma. And that's the rest of the, up to 60, about 40. Decimate of blood. So those are the numbers to be familiar with. Remember, when I up until this point, I've been just talking about PO2, right? 104 or 40. For the CO2. Okay. 104, 40. And PO2, PCO2, it only refers the blood gases that are dissolved. Turns out those are, that's not it. There's other ways that you chemically react or combine uh, the O2, CO2. So it looks like for the oxygen, there's two ways you can transport it. One dissolved, two bound to hemoglobin. Um, it looks like for carbon dioxide, there's three ways to dissolve bound to hemoglobin in the form of bicarb. So that's basically what you take it away, what, it took, what you take away as we proceed. But are there any questions on those numbers? I have a question. When you were talking about the bicarbonate HCO3 and you said there's a CO2 in there, what does that CO2 do? Yeah, what does that do? Like what does that mean? Well, it has to react with the CO2 to get here. Here's our CO2. Uh -huh. Combine it with water. That chemical reaction going either way, you get this. <coughs> this H2CO3 is carbonic acid. And then, and then, that partially dissociates into into that bicarb and a proton. Okay, and this bicarb short for bicarbonate, that is actually what is transported in the blood. Okay. But that's the chemistry that has to go through to get there. So because it says, you know, it's chemically, it can be, blood gases chemically react. You guys do chemistry, right? That should refresh your memory. <laughs> All right, um, uh, th I like this figure. It kind of shows the importance of hemoglobin. Pretend you have blood without hemoglobin. The only way to just get it in there is just to bubble it in. So if you equilibrate PO2, PO2, get it in there, that's only like three. I said 0.3, but because I put deciliters, but they put liters. So it's off by a factor of 10, that's why. Um, but the point is that if you have hemoglobin, not only do you bubble it in, you chemi it's chemically bound to the hemoglobin. And now, in addition to the three, you get 197 for a total of 200. Again, we're off by a factor of 10. Uh, I, I, I told you 20. Okay, the resources I use typically use mills per deciliter up mills per liter, but it shouldn't matter. It's the same value, just different units. And the concept is the vast majority of oxygen is transported bound to hemoglobin. Okay. Um, you know, there are some animals that live in the Arctic that don't have hemoglobin. Right? You can look up the crocodile ice fish lives in, I think, in Antarctica. They have yellow blood because there's no hemoglobin. They just transport blood like this. In colder temperatures, that water is more oxygen rich. And um, they can just get a lot more oxygen in their plasma. But it turns out they need to like breathe more, or not breathe more, but they need to circulate more because they don't have hemoglobin. But they can live fine without hemoglobin. But we, we need the hemoglobin. And one thing I like how they illustrate the hemoglobin is a circle four square grid. 
Okay, let me clear this board. I used to say this lecture is really hard because of the chemistry. Um, and then someone came to me and said, I thought I was joking because they didn't think it was hard at all. So I just stopped saying it because I guess it's relative depending on who you are. If you have a tough time as chemistry, this may be harder for you. If you don't, this may be easy to use. I really don't know where you fall. But there is a lot of chemistry in this lecture. Let's symbolize hemoglobin like this. Hemoglobin's a tetramer, and it can bind four O2s. So let's pretend that that's O2. So if I put an oxygen in all four places, that's 100% saturation. Okay, And so the idea is hemoglobin we want hemoglobin to be saturated with O2. That's kind of the way they say oxygen is bound to the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, oxygen, saturation, that, that's kind of the idea. So get the word saturated in your lexicon because that's the primary way you transport it. Uh, oxyhemoglobin. So, hemoglobin saturation of oxygen is the most important way oxygen is transported. We want hemoglobin to be saturated. It's a good thing. And it's pretty efficient. Your hemoglobin is almost 100% saturated. That means every little space is occupied. Okay. So, question. What determines whether or not hemoglobin will bind oxygen? Answer, PO2. We just go right back to that. Um, if the partial pressure of O2 is high, saturation is high. Okay, so those two go hand in hand. So that's why even though the PO4, or excuse me, the PO2 of 104 millimeters of mercury, it's basically a, a low value, but that number determines saturation, which is super important. So this is a very important graph in every physiology book. When they determine the relationship of saturation to oxygen tension, PO2. Okay, and this is the relationship. So they call this the oxygen saturation hemoglobin curve. basically PO2 in millimeters of mercury on the x-axis, and they plot that against O2 saturation, HPO2 sat on the y-axis. And before I put numbers to it, just the idea is well, let's say you have, you're in an environment where there's low O2, okay? Any environment, inside the body, outside the body. It's just, there's just low oxygen tension. The partial pressure is low. What this data shows us is that the saturation is low. Put a data point there. What this is showing us is if oxygen tension in the environment is high, Saturation is high. Okay, and I think that's easy enough to understand. If there's a lot of oxygen around, it'll bind to the hemoglobin. It'll fully saturate it. And if there's not a lot of oxygen around, it won't saturate it hardly at all because there's just not a lot of oxygen around. The question becomes, well, what's the relationship in between? Is it linear? If you look at that, is that exactly a straight line? 
not quite a straight line. I drew a straight line. That's not quite a straight line. And what the physiologist is trying to teach us is, well, basically, we call that um, an S-shaped curve, a sigmoid-shaped curve. It makes sense it could be linear, but it's not quite linear. It's more S-shaped. And so what we can do is draw a, a line that looks more like um, it kind of like has a plateau phase, and it, but then there's this huge drop-off. It looks kind of like that, more like S-shaped. So a plateau, then a huge drop. And I label it on the slide, plateau, steep slope. shape curve. That's actually beneficial for external respiration. I put some pretend you're, um, you're at sea level or pretend you're at altitude. That's like a high peak uh, the highest peak, for example, in Lake Tahoe is about 10,000 feet from Mount Whitney, about 14,000 feet, just to give you some reference. So you have the top of mountain there. But at sea level, PO2 in the air is about 100. Sea level, PO2 is about 100 millimeters mercury. So I'll just put 100. And when you look at the graph or the data table, it says that at a partial pressure O2 of 100, saturation is like 97.5. That's almost 100% saturated. So that's a percentage of saturation. That's a high level, okay? But let's pretend you drive up to where the air is thinner, um, say 12,000 feet. At 12,000 feet, the PO2 is about 50. So I put an arrow at 50, and I boxed 50 just like I did for 100. I drew it right there, okay? And if you eyeball that, it's about 83.5. You drop oxygen tension by half, but saturation doesn't cut in half. What's half of 97? Like 43 point something, something like that. But actually, saturation remains high at about 83.5%. So it's not a linear relationship. Because if you cut it in half, this number should be cut in half, but it's not. Okay, you see what I'm saying there? So, Basically, that's why we call it the plateau. It's like even though the oxygen is thinning out in the air you breathe, your saturation is still hanging in there. It's hanging in there. Um, I just think to myself, while you can go to a mountaintop, you're still getting pretty good saturation. That doesn't mean you won't notice a change. Okay, you may get altitude sickness, you may get headaches. There's different symptoms, you can look it up. Okay. Um, but anyways, any questions of what I, that I talked about here? That this plateau, right around here, you start thinning the air out, but saturation of your hemoglobin in your lungs is remaining relatively high. Okay. Well, then what? what why do you need the steep slope? You know, this part. Why is there a huge drop off? Well, for external respiration, the blood is picking up 
the O2. But don't you have to drop it off? Yes, you do. So, uh, I'll skip slow. It's good for the internal respiration. Because in the tissues, in the peripheral tissues, the PO2 is low. So I'll just put tissues. Well, um, let me, let's remind ourselves of what it is. And if you'll allow me to go back to the slide at the beginning of the talk. talked about this slide <coughs> and we said that the PO2, PCO2, those numbers are about 40, 45. Let's just stick with O2. It's 40 or less than 40. Okay. HP saturation, think about that. I'll go now on the fast forward back to where it was. Thank you. I want you to look at the table and you tell me. Just read it off the table. What's the uh, saturation at 40? 75. 75, very good. Yeah. So what does that mean in terms of how I drew it before as a four square grid? How many got off the bus? One, right? It's seventy-five percent saturated. That means one got off and was delivered to the tissues. Well, you're like, why not all of it? Well, I guess the body didn't need all of it. You're only going to meet your metabolic demands. So if you just lay around on the couch all day, you can just may do that. But what if you go out and run ten miles? Well, your metabolic needs will increase dramatically, and so. Uh, if you exercise, well, what exercising is, think about it this way, you're creating hypoxia in your working muscles, okay? And so the number drops from 40 to 30 to 20. Let's drop it to 20. You really, you're in the zone. You're working out hard, killing yourself out there, hopefully safely with a proper trainer, right? You're in the gym working out under correct supervision. I don't want anyone to go out there and actually, you can die from exercising. I have to be careful when I say in a lecture. But look how much it drops off. You go from 40 to 20, you go from 75 to 35. So it's like you cut it in half, 40 to 20, you cut the saturation more than half. So you're dropping really fast. So you're dropping off more O2 to meet metabolic demands of exercise. So let me just write that. Drop off more O2 to meet metabolic demands. If you get the impression that Dr. Wong wants me to go out and exercise, you would be correct. I was an exercise science major, so that was my thing. I remember one of my professors, uh, Ed Bernauer, he was like, his thing was he always drilled into my head, I remember to this day, like 25 years later. Exercise is not a mere variant of the condition of rest. It is the essence of the machine. It is drilled that into us. So yes, you should go out and exercise safely. That's one thing you can take away from my course. So they kind of show that to you here. Well, this is kind of blurry. I, I, this is straight from your book. Let me see if I can get a better figure here. Yeah. OK. Yeah, well, I think we can pick it up here after a break. This is a good spot. Come back in about 15 minutes.